Kings chapter 16 through 17. Elijah, my God is Yahweh. Ahab was a very bad king, and his wife Jezebel was even worse. She was a worshiper of Baal, a pagan god of fire and fertility. God was very angry with King Ahab and Jezebel for leading people astray and sent a prophet named Elijah with a message. As surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, the God whom I worship and serve, there will be no rain during the next few years until I give the word. King Ahab and Jezebel were furious. God told Elijah to get out of there quickly and hide near a brook. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah camped near the brook and drank from it. Ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening. But because there was no rainfall in the land, the brook that Elijah was drinking from began to dry up. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the city of Zarephath. There is a widow who will feed you there. So Elijah went to Zarephath. When Elijah arrived in the city gate, he saw a widow gathering sticks and asked her to bring him some water and bread. She explained that she only had enough oil and flour for one last meal for her and her son. Elijah promised her, The Lord our God says that there will always be flour in your bin and oil in your jar until he allows it to rain again. And from then on, no matter how much oil and flour the widow used, she always had enough. Sometime later, the widow's son got very sick, and then he died. The widow cried out to Elijah, Why did this happen? Did you come here to punish me for my sins by killing my son? Give me your son, Elijah said. Then he laid the boy out on the bed in the upper room. Elijah began to pray over the boy. Three times he did this, and on the third time the boy's life returned to him. Elijah brought the boy downstairs and gave him to his mother. The woman fell on her knees and said, Now I know you are the man of God, and he speaks through you. The drought in Israel was in its third year. People were starving and dying of thirst. God told Elijah, The time for the drought is nearing its end. Go and present yourself to King Ahab. So Elijah headed south and back into Israel. In the meantime, King Ahab had sent a man called Obadiah out to search for pastures and water for his horses. While he was searching, he found Elijah. Go and tell King Ahab that I am here, Elijah told him. King Ahab went out to meet Elijah. So Israel's great troublemaker has returned, Ahab snarled. God had another message for Ahab through Elijah. Go and bring the 450 prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel, along with the 400 prophets of Asherah. Then summon all the people of Israel. It is time for the contest of the gods. So messengers were sent out to summon the priests of the false gods and the people of Israel to gather on Mount Carmel. So 850 false prophets and a vast crowd gathered on Mount Carmel in the north of Israel. Elijah addressed a large crowd of onlookers. How long will you waver between two gods? You cannot be loyal to both. Today is the day that you will choose one or the other. If Baal is God, choose him. But if the one true God of Israel is God, then worship only him. Then at God's command, Elijah began to direct the setup for the contest. Bring me two bulls and some wood. The prophets of Baal get the first choice. Let them choose a bull, prepare it, and lay it on the wood on their altar. Elijah continued, I will prepare the other bull on the other altar, then call on the name of your God. I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the one true God. And all the people agreed. So the prophets of Baal prepared the bull and began to call the name of Baal all morning, shouting, O oh, Baal, answer us! But there was no answer. They began to dance wildly and chant around the altar they had made, but still not a hint of a reply. By afternoon, Elijah started to have fun with the situation and began to taunt the prophets. Maybe your God is away on a business trip. Perhaps he is sleeping. Or maybe he's in the bathroom or in deep thought. I think you should call him a little louder. So they shouted louder and even began to cut themselves, thinking this would get Baal's attention. But still, nothing. After the prophets of Baal spent all morning and most of the afternoon trying to get their God to answer them, there was no response. The false prophets collapsed on the ground in exhaustion. It was now Elijah's turn. 
Elijah took twelve stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, to repair the altar of God. Then he dug a trench around the altar. He had the bowl laid on the wood on the altar and requested that four large jars of water be poured over the bowl, the wood, and the altar. So they did as Elijah requested. Then he told them to do it a second time, and they did. Finally he asked for a third drenching, and they did it again. By this time the trenches were dug all around the altar were overflowing with water. The people looked in disbelief, as the altar was soaked in water. How could this altar be set on fire? It was evening by now, and Elijah went to the altar and prayed, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are the God in Israel. I am your servant, and I have done all that you have commanded. O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you are the one true God. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. The people were in awe. They began to cry out, The Lord is God! The Lord is God! They chased after the prophets of Baal and put the false pagan prophets to death. Elijah turned to Ahab, It hasn't rained for three years, but I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Then he went up on the mountain with a servant to pray for rain. Six times as he prayed, he sent a servant to look out over the sea and report what he saw. Six times he returned to say that there was not a cloud in the sky. Elijah kept praying. The seventh time the servant went and looked, he returned to report. I see a cloud rising from the sea, but it's no larger than a man's hand. Hurry to Ahab, Elijah told his servant, and tell him to climb into his chariot and race back home. If he doesn't hurry, the rain will stop you. Ahab quickly left for his home in Jezreel. The winds were kicking up and the skies were getting darker and darker. Ahab had his horses pulling his chariot as fast as they could go. Faster, faster, he shouted. Heavy rain began to fall. Now the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak up into his belt and ran faster than the horse pulling Ahab's chariot. Elijah beat Ahab to the entrance gate in Jezreel. Hello friends, I hope you enjoyed our slideshow there about Elijah and I thought I would like to spend a couple weeks on Elijah. I read you the whole account that actually is from 1 Kings chapter 16 through 19 about Elijah and the things that he accomplished as a prophet, but I thought this week we would just kind of overview Elijah, talk about what his name meant, what his goal was for Israel, what God had chosen him to do, and maybe a little bit about where Israel was at this time. Well, Elijah's name meant, my God is Yahweh. And if you remember in some of the lessons that we've talked about before, that Yahweh was the name that was given God. It was the highest name that was given God. Even the Jewish scholars couldn't spell the whole name out when they were writing it because they wanted to treat it with such respect. And Yahweh was the one that was the provider and sovereign over all. And Elijah, in his time, when he was chosen to be a prophet, Israel had forgotten that. And the name of the books of the Bible, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, when it talks about that, that's exactly what the time period was for Israel. You remember when God was ruler over Israel, but they didn't think it was enough, and so they asked him to give them a king. And so he gave them a king and saw. But the point of giving them a human king wasn't so that they could get what they wanted. It was that they would see that Saul was just that, a human. And he wasn't able to rule just like God but that God had given Saul something, if he wanted to rule well, it was the word of God. And they had that through the prophets and the, that was around him in Samuel. And they had that through the different parts of the Old Testament, some of the books of the Old Testament that they did have written down. And they were given the law. And, and Saul could have followed the law, the word of the Lord, and held to it. And he would have been able to make right decisions, but that wasn't good enough for him. And so then successfully on down the line, there were other kings too. Some of them chose to do what was right. And some of them chose very, very wrong. And even then, Israel was separated into two different kingdoms, a north and a south kingdom. 
And even then there were battles and places to worship and more idols that were brought in from the lands around them. And so it was becoming a big mess. So in the middle of these kings who were showing they were not the Messiah that was promised, the King of Kings, there were prophets, men of God, that God introduced to the nation of Israel so they could hear exactly what God meant for them to do. Elijah was one of those prophets. Someone who was born in a place that shouldn't even matter to anybody was raised by God and chosen by God to tell the kings that they should follow the word of God. And even Elijah's name was a testimony to God. Elijah's name meant, again, my God is Yahweh. And during his time, there was a specific king that we heard about and his wife Jezebel, King Ahab and Jezebel, that had forgotten that God was king. Remember we heard about how he was idol worshiping all of the other gods in the area? And Jezebel wasn't even an Israelite. She was a pagan priestess from someplace else. And so he had even married someone that wouldn't even have the same values as he did. And that caused a big mess. So Elijah's name, my God is Yahweh, was Elijah's purpose. God intended for Elijah to point those king to Christ, the king and his wife to Christ, and to point them to God as the king over all of Israel, who, were, who was who they were supposed to be worshiping and who they were supposed to be pointing others to. But King Ahab got angry, and he even brought out his own prophets like we saw on the mountain. And we'll look at that story a little bit closer in the later weeks. Also, Elijah, not only did his name mean God, is, my God is Yahweh, not only was his purpose to point people to that, he also was called a prophet because he was a forth teller. He didn't tell them fortunes like they would go to their prophets for that were false prophets and the witches that were in the town there. They would go ask them to cast lots or to ask their gods or their idol-worshipping idol people to see if that was the truth. That's not what Elijah wanted them to hear from him. He wanted them to hear the word of the Lord. And whatever Elijah said as far as telling them was what was going to happen was because it aligned with what God said in his law. That if you disobey there would be punishment, that there would be consequence to pay. But if you would turn and repent and ask God for help, there would be forgiveness. And so Elijah's purpose in telling people that God was the only way was God reaching out to the kings to redeem them, to give them the opportunity to ask for, for forgiveness and turn away from their wicked ways and be able to experience the grace of God. I like this bringing it into Philippians 2 as well, because Philippians 2 talks about Christ's humility on the cross and that he laid down his life for us in humility. But I like also the last part of that section because it tells us the truth about why Christ came also and when he obeyed what happened. And listen to this. It starts in verse 9. For this reason God highly exalted him, being Christ, God highly exalted Christ. What was the reason? Because it says in verse 8, He humbled himself by become obedient, becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the knee of Je name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So Elijah was able to accomplish this through the miracles, the way that he prayed for the widow and his son to be raised from the dead, and how he prayed a simple prayer in front of the prophets, please prove to them that you are the God of Israel, and how he prayed for the rain to stop, and then he prayed and the rain started again. And although Elijah was a man just like us, and we'll see how he could be just like us because he experienced deep sadness too. That he always pointed people to God in God's word because God gave him strength to show that God was the God of Israel. And I think for us this week that I want us to just have hope. 
that we can know that God is the God over all, that he's in charge of all, that he knows all, that he understands all, but that the reason why we go through things and the reason why we're experiencing the things that we are here on earth is because of sin and consequences of our own choices and the choices that others make around us. And that our responsibility isn't necessarily to be able to fix those things, but our responsibility is to respond in kindness and graciousness and humility and with the truth of God for the purpose of showing others that our God is Yahweh. I'm praying for you this week and I pray that you have that hope and that encouragement of who God is and that He is your God. And that if you don't know who God is and that He isn't your God, that you would talk to your parents and ask them. Ask them to tell you how to know for sure that God is your God. Have a great week.